So now it's up to you to decide whether this makes sense or not. But ultimately the question is, now that we have such a big problem, how do we solve it? Well, to solve this problem, we need to learn from Brazil and China. In fact, we learned about ethanol blending from Brazil, but Brazil implemented ethanol blending very, very smartly and very smoothly. Today, every liter of Brazilian gasoline contains at least 27% ethanol. But the real game changer is that over 80% of cars are flex fuel vehicles, which means drivers themselves choose at the pump whether to fill up petrol, ethanol or any mix in between. And their engines are capable of handling all combinations. So these drivers can choose whichever fuel is cheaper on that particular day. This everyday choice, backed by policy and infrastructure, created the world's most successful biofuel ecosystem. And the reason why Brazil is able to do it at scale is because Brazil did not rush into high ethanol blending overnight. They started with E10 in 1970s and gradually increased to E27 over four long decades. Three decades after the first oil shock rocked its economy, Brazil has shaken its dependence on foreign oil. When they began to distribute ethanol, a combustible alcohol made from sugarcane, at the time, the fuel was offered at just 16 pumps in five cities. Today, it is available at all pumps across the country and has surpassed gas as the number one fuel. So the lesson for India is pretty clear. Extend E20 rollout to 2030 and instead of the current aggressive timeline, execute it in phases. Start with E10 and then go to E20 gradually by 2030. Because as the Niti Aayog document says, if you really have to reap the benefits of foreign exchange, low fuel cost and farmer incomes, we need to give our automotive manufacturers the four-year preparation window. Otherwise, if there's a backlash, the government will have no option but to roll it back. And that would defeat the benefits that we could potentially reap in five years. This is how we can eliminate the 